And so um, for those who are just coming into this recording late, um, all this stuff is already on Canvas, the due dates, Canvas activity, lab two, homework B1. Uh, there's an arena competition, which is available as an alternative to your final project. And then for the Brickyard computers, you can access them by remote. And for those of you who have used these in the past, uh, then you might have had some sluggishness. Um, I've been told specifically that they have upgraded how these things are implemented on hardware and on the virtual machines that run these things. And you should get, they're telling me, very similar access or very similar speeds that you would get if you were in person on these machines. And so before they're kind of relegated to whatever kind of cycles were left over. But now when you connect to a remote machine, it is it gets the same resources that a local machine would get in its entirety. So um, as long as you've got good bandwidth, then you should be able to get good access to these machines. Um, Arena, there's a free student version also that's downloadable, but of course, you need a Windows machine or a Windows emulator on a Mac. The um, other option that you can consider if you would like to investigate FlexSim is a, a competitor to Arena. And IISE also runs a competition with FlexSim. And they do that every year. And I'm happy for you to do this instead of happy to do this instead of your um, uh, the uh, in, in place of or as your final project. So you can definitely do that. Um, but the only catch is that we won't talk about FlexSim specifically in this class. And so the amount of support you'll get specifically for FlexSim is gonna be a lot limited. The components of FlexSim are very, very similar to Arena. They're both discrete event system simulation tools. They're both very popular in industry use. Um, this one you know, has teams up to four students and it usually uh, has a very healthcare focus. And so if you're interested in healthcare, you're interested in FlexSim, then you might consider this one instead of Arena. Of course, you don't have to do either. You can just uh, stick with the uh, standard arena final project. Hey, Professor. Yes. Um, for the arena uh, competition, do we need to have like any uh, prior like experience in any like specific like coding languages or like in arena or like what we learn what we need to do for that in class if we choose to compete? Uh, you'll you'll learn what you need to learn um, in class about arena in order to do that, and you will be competing with your peers. And so usually the people who enter these competitions are ones at a similar stage in their um, in kind of their academic career. And so the other participants will be just kind of learning arena as well. Competitive entries though, will probably need to read ahead in the text a little bit, maybe do a little bit more visualization, use more of the 3D work than we kind of get into. Um, and so there, if you wanna be competitive and really go for that first, second and third, you'll probably need to do more than kind of just the basics that we get in the class. But you sure, certainly should be able to enter the competition um, and complete it using only the stuff that we learn in class and in lab. Okay, good to know, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Professor, yeah. are we able to work with other people in the class on one of these projects and still submit that as our final project? That's exactly right. So if you form a, uh, a team of, so your, your final projects are already group projects. And so this can be your project group. So if there are four people in the class and you wanna to get together and submit this as your final project, then, um, then that would be fine. Um, I would actually prefer that over say, I'm gonna take two people out of the class and two people um, outside of, two people in the class and two people outside of the class. Then it gets a little funny about um, getting assistance from people outside of the class and something you're submitting as your final project. But um, yeah, you could, um, if you have friends or just other people taking this class that uh, you would like to team up with, I would encourage that for this. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about these different project options? Okay, great. Um, so there are several other DES simulation competitions as well. Example, Simio is another popular alternative to Flex Sim and Arena. Uh, they uh, also have an annual competition and I'm willing to consider these. So if you see one of these and you really think, man, I would I'd be interested in doing this uh, for my final project, just send me a note uh, with maybe a link to the competition and some other details or why you're interested in that. And, um, and then 
I would be happy to consider it. Uh, Simeo is actually kind of natural because the, so the folks who created Arena, when they then left Rockwell, they started Simeo as kind of meant to be like in a, in a and our next generation arena or something. So they're extremely similar. So, um, so yeah, if you see these other competitions, so long as they're focused on discrete event system simulation, then most likely I would be okay with them. But just talk to me offline and we'll figure that out. All right, so any other questions? Okay, great. All right, well, let's get back to the technical stuff. So um, just a review from last time. The, we are we're now starting to introduce discrete event system simulations. These are systems that uh, change their state only at countable instants of time that we refer to as uh, events. So an event is an instantaneous occurrence that potentially changes a system state. We take what we referred to last time as a process centric perspective. And so we have these objects that are moving through the system that are passive. So these like blue dots and this little cartoon of a DES system. And we design the kind of, um, you know, pinball machine that they bounce around. And so we know that they are created in a certain area. They linger in other areas. There are decision points where they can go back around to different areas or they can go to new areas. Um, we do not write programs for what goes on on the individual pinballs, but instead we write programs for what goes on in the areas and when an area releases a pinball to the next area or how long it holds on to that pinball. And so that's why we say it's a process centric perspective is that our code will be written in the perspective of the resources that are limiting these objects that are moving through them as opposed from the perspective of the objects themselves. So those objects we refer to as entities. Um, so these are the kind of players in the simulation game that move around, change their status, affect and feel effects of the presence of other entities. So they are passive objects that are kicked around by these processes that I was mentioning before. Um, they um, have their, you can have different types of entities and different realizations of each type simultaneously. So as a, as a tip for like your homeworks and the labs, if I say I would like you to come up with two entities or two types of entities for um, this system, and you might say I can only really come up with one, let's say it's customers. I came up with the entity customers and I just can't figure out what is another entity for this system. Well, customers might be too generic. You could split that into say, well, we've got phone in customers and we've got maybe in person customers. And those are two types of customers and they might have slightly different processes. And this is why we might want to divide them up. So um, as we're talking about, we're going to talk about attributes in a second here. You, you can sometimes have one generic entity type and then have attributes which then separate out this entity from another, or you can get rid of those attributes and instead just have two completely different entity types that are being created in separate processes and then merge together and interact within the system. So if you're having trouble coming up with your second or third or fourth entity type, ask yourself if maybe you're being overly generic in the entities you have come up with and if there's a way to break those down a little bit. Now, um, entities usually represent real tangible things such as customers or parts that move through a manufacturing system. So usually if you can see something moving in the system, then maybe it will be moving in the simulation. And if it's moving in the simulation, then that means it's probably an entity. But you can also have these fake virtual entities for ease of modeling. As an example, I frequently have people modeling uh, intersections, traffic intersections in their final project. And in order to model a traffic intersection, you need to model cycle times as you cycle from green to red. And so to get that timing right, what a lot of people will do is they create a virtual entity that lingers in a process that waits for the cycle time to elapse. Or to, um, to, uh, to elapse. And then once it emerges from that, then just cycles back around into that same waiting block. But every time it goes through that cycle, it switches the lights from northbound to eastbound um, in terms of which one's got the green light. And so there's this virtual entity which is just moving the simulation around. There is no, um, you know, gnome 
that's that's magically walking around inside the traffic light controller that you're simulating from the physical world but in the simulated world it's just easier to simulate it as an entity that's stuck in this constant loop and every time it loops it switches the traffic direction so that's an example where we can't have virtual entities but for the most part the entities that we come up with usually match to something that looks like an entity in the real world those entities can have attributes to differentiate them. So if you wanna stick with a generic entity, you still might need to differentiate between some entities and others within the same type. And that's what we use attributes for. You can say this entity came in earlier than that other entity. This entity has a different request type than that entity. This customer wants to order a drink. This other customer wants to order food. Well, those might be different attribute types. So a bunch of common attribute types that uh, you're almost always gonna have are things like arrival time. You almost always care about what time an entity arrived to the system because you wanna keep track of how long that entity was there because you might need to prioritize entities that have been there for a long amount of time. Um, due date, so if you've got an entity that's gonna expire and you need to be able to process it before it's due, that's another one. Or you just stamp priority on it. You say this, this customer paid uh, extra to be in the TSA pre-check. And so we need to make sure that whenever they get into a queue, they're put to the front of the queue and that's we can stamp them with a priority attribute and so on. These are variables that are local to the entity. You can treat them as state variables. So you can change them on the fly and you can then use those changes to then change how they're processed down the line. Um, the other important thing, which I mentioned um, on the Canvas resource, is that sometimes this is, it, it's actually easiest to, th to think about these things first, and those are the resources. Those are the, the parts of the process that are required to perform all of the activities on the entity. And so it's kind of like um, if you were building a car wash, then before you focus on all the different types of cars that come in, you might focus on well, what you need in order to be a car wash. Well, you know, you need, the, you need all of the tools that you need to wash a car, and those are the resources. And how many of those resources sort of sets up the rest of what the car wash looks like and all the other constraints and all that. So the things that entities are competing for, all there are the resources. Resources in the simulation model are generally going to be stuck there. You're gonna draw them in a diagram and they're gonna stay in that diagram for the whole simulation. Um, the entities might flow into the diagram and might flow out of the diagram, but the resources are gonna be stuck on the diagram. Now that doesn't mean they are stuck in place in the real world. I'll give you an example in just a second here where the resource is the thing moving and the entities are the things that are fixed in physical space. But when you actually simulate the model, the resources are the things that are gonna be stuck in place, just temporarily visited by entities that then flow out of them as they go away. So entities compete for these things, resources um, in common examples, people like clerks, port reps, equipment like machines or computers, uh, space like the number of seats in a classroom or the number of um, lines on a telephone trunk. So an entity seizes the resource and then releases it. So entities don't own resources, they just kind of temporarily are assigned to them. And a resource can have several units of capacity. So we can say that rather than saying there are 100 resources in a classroom where each one of them is a seat, we can say there is a seat resource in a classroom and it has a capacity of 100. So that's another term that we'll, we'll use there. And we can, what's nice about that is we can then change the capacity during a simulation. So let's say you're simulating a, um, a set of, you know, a restaurant or something like that, or a bank, and there's a certain number of clerks available at that bank. Well, different times a day, you might only have one clerk or you might have five clerks. We can generally have a clerk resource and then we can schedule the capacity so that sometimes the capacity is one and sometimes the capacity is five and that will automatically change from one to five as needed. All right, so are there any uh, questions about these three uh, major things here? Um, the uh, activities or entities, attributes, and resources. Is this starting to become clear how these things uh, differ? Any questions can go in the chat. Uh, they can also, you can unmute. Uh, LJ, do you have a question? I see you're yeah. unmuted. 
Yeah, just a quick question. So like, I know, so I see that like resources can be like, you know, like, like they're like within the system, but there are, there also like, how do we know like contexts where like people who are in the system, like say like waiters or like, you know, factory workers could also be like entities, you know, like how do we like figure that out? That, uh, oh, it could also be entities, right? So, um, so like a, a waiter is a funny one, right? Because a waiter is moving around, but we normally assume that the waiter is stuck within the restaurant, at least over the period of time we're simulating. So normally we think of a waiter as a resource because someone needs a waiter in order to get food and because you need it, then it's a resource. Now, there can be other aspects of the system where the waiter becomes an entity. Let's say, for example, um, a waiter brings an order of food into the kitchen and can't leave the kitchen until that food order is ready. Well, now the, in the waiter is bringing the orders in and the waiter is leaving the kitchen. The kitchen is the limited resource and the waiters are waiting on the kitchen. So I would say that if you ever have something that is waiting on something else until it can move forward, it is probably an entity and the thing it is waiting on is probably a resource. And so of course, sometimes things wait on other things. So, you know, sometimes you wait on a waiter and sometimes a waiter waits on a chef. And so depending on the question that you're answering in your operations research problem is going to change uh, the roles in which these things play in your simulation model. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, here's another motivational example. Oh, uh, Cameron, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, real quick. So just touching on the example you just brought up, so in the example of where a waiter becomes an entity, would the, you brought up like the chefs, I guess, would be a resource because you have a limited number of them that are making and providing the food. Would the food, I guess, in that case, be considered almost like a product? I know that's not one of our labels, but would that be just the thing of focus and your chefs are the resource and your waiters are the entity coming in and out of your system? Excellent question. So um, there's multiple ways to skin a cat, as they say. Um, in the the way I would most naturally view that is I would say that um, you know a, a waiter comes in with an order um, for a particular type of food, and then the chef makes the food and leaves with it. And so when the waiter leaves with that food, I might have an attribute on the waiter which represents the food that that waiter is now carrying. Maybe like so, an order number or a specific type of food, something like that. That's right. Okay. That's right. This, this is carrying a salad and this one's, you know, a steak or something okay. like that. Um, now, there might be times where I actually need to promote food into something that is somehow more tangible. And that might be if I think about the resources that limit what foods you can make. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it might be that in order for me to make a salad, I need lettuce and I need tomatoes. I need them both to be available at the same time. Well, now, um, now I'm getting into the points where maybe I really need to specifically model, um, you know, lettuce and tomatoes entering the system and being used in particular ways and exiting the system. And so there's, you might view, well, okay, well then does that make the lettuce and tomatoes the resources because they're being weighted on? Well, and that's a really interesting case where they can actually be entities where an entity can sit in a waiting zone, waiting for another entity until there's enough of them available. And then you can create a batch and then that batch moves on. So we have batching operators, which almost turn entities into temporary resources because entities have to wait for enough other entities to arrive in order for you to have a, a batch, which is another type of entity that can move on. So things can get much more complicated. Right now we're just kind of covering the basics, but, okay. um, and you might feel like, man, my, the problems of interest to me aren't quite being represented here quite yet. And that's fine because we will get more complex and we just want to sort of get an approximation of the tools we currently have available and then we'll add to them as we go to better suit more realistic systems. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Sure, any other questions? Excellent questions. Thank you for that, that interaction. Oh, I'm sorry, Jessica, I missed your chat question. So I wonder, similar to the one of how does the food fit in and would it be the resource to the chef? Um, yeah, so hopefully that, that, that helped that, that question there. Um, foods, we normally, even though we view food as a resource, like, um, you know, it's almost like a natural resource. You have to find enough of it and bring it in. In a discrete event system, usually a resource is not something 
that is permanently consumed. A resource is something that is temporarily used and while being used, it cannot be used by any others. And then it's renewable. So it's almost like um, resources in the green system are a renewable resource that is, um, that, that is, I guess, our rivalrous in that um, when, one, uh, when, when one entity uses them, another entity can't. But when another entity gets, uh, lets go of it, it suddenly becomes available. So we have to be careful about food, thinking about food as a resource, because it's rare that food is one of those types of things that is suddenly renewed. But a cleaver that you need to cut something, well, that's a resource, because only one person can use it at a time. When they're done, they put it away. Now, it might need to be cleaned in order to be used again. So then we'd say, well, then a sink is a resource that cleans the cleaver. You know, so you can see these things kind of go down, downhill from there. Excellent, good. All right, so here's an example from my own research. Um, this is kind of trivialized, but um, so in, okay, I see um, a question here. So input materials to a process equals entity. Um, it, it all depends on how you, it, I mean, the best choice for this is gonna depend on your research question. So it often is the case that if you need to wait on a certain number of materials that are arriving before you can move on, then the, th the materials that arrive are themselves entities. And then, um, and then there's a batching operator, which then allows you to move on. And that ends up becoming useful because then you can ask, how long does one entity have to wait for another entity to show up? Like I might have uh, parts of my food spoil because I'm waiting so long for another part of them. And that might mean that I need to order um, the other, that I need the other thing to become available more quickly. So it's very common for these kind of spoilable resources to be viewed as entities. But if there's only a fixed number of those resources and you can recycle them continuously, then they would be resources. So this will become more clear as we move on, but these are all the right questions you should be asking, like, because there could be more than one way to go. So you should ask these questions of yourself and say, for my research question, is it gonna be easiest for me to implement this as an entity or as a resource? And, um, and the right answer to that is gonna vary. So as an example of that, so this is something that came from my own, my old grad work, where I was working on uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, individual vehicles like drones, for example, that would have to move around an environment and find, um, in, find things that were scattered around the environment and random places. And there were different types of things it could find, and it would be rewarded in different ways based on the different things it could find. And it had to come up with strategies for how long it should search in an area, <clears throat> um, given that eventually, you know, it has to leave an area because that area doesn't pay off very well. And so you can simplify this process by thinking about something like a Roomba uh, or a, a, a autonomous vacuum cleaner. This autonomous vacuum cleaner moves around the floors of, uh, of, you know, looking for dirt. The dirt is stationary and there's different types of dirt, maybe large chunks of dirt or small amounts of dust. And, um, and so if we think about it though, the, the dirt is the thing that's variable moving in and out of the vacuum cleaner, but the vacuum cleaner is always there. So even though the vacuum cleaner is the one that's moving, so these are traces of a vacuum cleaner, it's just basically a mobile resource. And we always know there's one vacuum cleaner stuck in one room, but we have no idea how much dirt is available there. So as the vacuum cleaner moves, the dirt arrives to the vacuum cleaner. So when we model this as a discrete event system simulation, we put our reference frame on the vacuum cleaner. And it's almost as if we make the floor move and the vacuum cleaner stay still. So it's like I've got a factory where I've got a conveyor belt, which is constantly loading things into a machine. And that machine is the vacuum cleaner. So we put ourselves on the vacuum cleaner and just let things arrive. And then as they arrive, we can make decisions like, do I even bother taking the time to process this dirt or I do let the dirt just go on by. And so the things that are arriving are the entities, um, even though in the real world, they're the things that are stationary and the vacuum cleaner is moving around. So we can generalize this process to, um, so ecologists use discrete event system simulations to model, for example, quail. If you've ever watched a Bob or a, um, 
Gamble's quail. That's a quail that we have here in Phoenix. They're the ones with the little things on their head running around. Those Gamble's quail, um, they, they've been modeled as how fast do they run around looking for prey. And so when those are modeled as discrete event system simulations, the quail is viewed as a resource in one place. And I see the question in the chat. We'll get to that in a second. And the um, prey items are viewed as arriving at the predator. So that's a little weird. In the, in the real world, a prey item wouldn't run up to a predator. The predator would have to go find the prey item. But it is easier to model as if the prey items just bump into this ambush predator that's where the predator is always sitting in one place. And then you can generalize this to undersea uh, water vehicles, um, you know, looking for mines, for example, uh, autonomous vehicles and military applications, and even flexible manufacturing systems where you might have the machines that are assembling things are moving around, but we might model them um, as if the stationary parts that they're bumping into are actually moving and finding the machines. So I just, just trying to emphasize that movement in the simulation model does not need to correspond to movement in the physical system. We make choices that make for the most efficient and elegant simulation model. And sometimes that mapping might mean uh, switching something that's stationary to something that's moving and vice versa. And then, so I see a question here. You, um, so you say that the dirt is an entity and the vacuum is a resource. Yes, that's what I'm saying here is that in the vacuum cleaner example, it is going to be easier to model the vacuum cleaner as a fixed resource and the dirt as entities arriving to the vacuum cleaner. That way we don't have to worry about like how the vacuum cleaner moves around. In our model, we just have a single vacuum cleaner block and then we have a stochastic model of how the entities arrive to that block. And that stochastic model, and I'll talk about stochastics here in a second, is um, going to capture all of the important movement details. So we're moving the movement details from the vacuum cleaner into the dirt to actually simplify the program that we write to stimulate the system. Okay. So are there any questions about those examples? Just trying to shake up the way we think about resources and activities. Okay. All right, the other um, <clears throat> terms that we covered last time, state variables. These are variables that you use in your program, say Arena or Python or however you're writing your discrete event system simulation to keep track of what's going on right now. So these are formal variables and, um, and they are used in the logic and calculations within a simulation. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, I saw a question here. Um, so in exams, could we model things that are not accurate in the real world to make uh, modeling easier? Would that still be correct? I don't want to say they're not accurate, but I'm saying they're a different perspective. So um, like, I mean, this kind of goes back to all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so we can say that in the real world, you can have a resource that's moving and entities that are stationary. Then we can say the model of the real world is that the resource is fixed and the um and the entities arrive at the resource now the way we model it we're not actually saying that the entities are moving we are just saying that from the perspective of the resources the entities arrive at a particular rate which may be random uh, randomness um, in their inter-arrival times now that's not inaccurate from the perspective of the vacuum cleaner, if the vacuum cleaner didn't know that it was mobile, if it thought the world was moving around it, that, that would be an accurate perspective. And so we're just shifting our reference frames. You might think from physics class, you might have thought that, you know, there's different ways of analyzing um, orbital dynamics, for example, whether you're taking the perspective of being an observer on Earth or an observer on the sun or observer on Mercury or whatever. That perspective is accurate. Um, regardless of where, because it's just a different perspective on the system. So I'm just saying that, that even though we're more accustomed to taking a perspective where we see entities moving around, uh, or maybe we see entities stationary and we see resources moving around, some things that will be valuable to take another perspective, which is also an accurate perspective of what does the world look like when you sit on top of the resource and allow the world to move around the resource as opposed to the resource to move around the world. Both are accurate, they're just different perspectives. I hope that makes sense. Now, 
I probably wouldn't give you the vacuum cleaner example on an exam. Um, I would probably stick to something more conventional, like the bank teller and things like that. Um, I'm not going to try to trick you up or, you know, give you things that are these, these trick questions. Um, uh, you know, if I'm asking you on an exam, what's the entity, what's the resource or whatever, given that there are judgment calls that have to be made, you know, there's sometimes things can be entities, sometimes can be resources. Um, for an exam, I will make it unambiguous and clear that there really is a best answer here. For the vacuum cleaner case, you know, there's probably a lot of different ways to model that. I would just bring it up to show you that, that you can think of these things differently. But I promise you when I assess you, it'll be a clearer answer. All right, so state variables. Um, state variables just help us keep track of things like um, what is the current number of entities waiting in line? Um, what is um, the actual list of entities that are waiting in line? What is the current time? These are things that we need if we were to pause the system, go off and eat lunch, come back and restart the system. So long as we loaded up all the state variables the exact same way, we could hit play and the system would keep going the same way it was about to keep going. So the state variables um, help us just sort of keep track of what's going on at the time. They may be updated at every step of the simulation, but they will only be updated at events, at these instantaneous events that change the state. So that's sort of the definition of an event is a time point that potentially could change the state of the system. So um, examples, um, uh, uh, so simulation logic can respond dynamically to these variables. So you can, uh, change logic based on what these variables are. So some people asked me about this um, over the last couple of days or email is that they said, well, I know that you said an activity can't depend on the state of the system, but couldn't you have someone like how efficient they are at doing an activity vary with how things are going in the system right now? So a cashier could look out and see there's 20 people waiting in line and that might change how quickly the cashier change um, how quickly the cashier processes the current customer. And yes, you can do that. You can use the state variables to update things that are going on, let's say in how the activities are being shaped. But the difference between activity and a delay is that the still in the activity, given that you know the state of the system, that's all you kind of need to know in order to figure out what that activity is going to be versus the delay, and we're gonna talk about this activity versus delay issue um, again here in more detail, but versus a delay where the only way you can figure out the delay is if you um, say know how long each customer took. So a delay is like how long does the entire line um, take in order to get processed, where an activity is how much is an individual customer. And we can reshape activities based on these state variables, but we can't reshape the, we can't call things that are only able to be measured after the simulation as activities. So it's, it's, um, it's one of these things that I think will become more clear as we move on here. But I do want to just make it clear that state variables can reshape any of your programming within the arena simulation, and that includes activity links. And so arrival rates, for example, um, how frustrated a certain cashier is and how that changes their performance, these all can in principle be affected by state variables, but they don't have to. So that'll become more clear, I think, as we go on. So activities versus delays. Activities are the things we can program ahead of time. So we know that every single time we simulate a bank, there is a certain distribution of time it takes for a, a clerk, let's say, to cash a check. And that distribution might change based on the number of people waiting in line because they look out and they see how many people are waiting in line. And so we could say, well, okay, so if a cashier is cashing a check and they see five people waiting in line, there's always this distribution. If they see one person waiting line, there's this distribution, but still it's local to the cashier and we can program that ahead of time. And this differs versus a delay, which we measure after the simulation run. And the delay might be um, on average, how long did someone in the line have to wait before that cashier was even able to see them? In that case, we don't know that ahead of time. We just, the only way we could possibly know the average time a customer is going to wait before a cashier serves them is, is by simulating the system 
looking at all sorts of customers and how long they waited and then taking statistical information from those to then formulate that answer. So we've used activities as inputs and delays as outputs. So activities uh, may be variable, but they should not depend upon the system state. And what I mean by that is, again, you can have the, the cashier adjust her performance based on a state variable, but um, what we call an activity um, can, needs to be something that we don't need to run the simulation in order to do. If we have to run the simulation to make that measurement, then um, it is conditioned on the simulation. And so it's, we call it a delay. So delays are things we have to measure afterwards. Activities are things we can come up with a model for beforehand. So this I think will come, will make more sense as we move forward. All right, so are there questions about any of this so far? So just review of what we talked about last time. And hopefully now that you've had a chance to do lab one and maybe start on the first homework, you've had some practice with these. All right, so let's uh, move forward and closer to kind of new stuff. This is about where we stopped last time. Um, mentioned that in a discrete event system simulation, timing is key. We are building models for how the timing of these systems plays out. And in an airport situation here, we've got people arrive, they have different numbers of people in their party, um, they arrive at different times. So in an hour, you can have five parties arriving, but they all arrive with different intervals in between them. And so, whereas a, dis a deterministic approach might assume that you just get five arrivals per hour, and so there's going to be, um, you know, uh, so there's gonna be 60 minutes divided by five, um, in between each all of them. And so they all will have the exactly the same amount in between, but that's not very realistic. Another deterministic approach would be to try to come up with all of the historical information of every party. So how many kids they have, um, how many adults, um, what is the personality of each of the adults, um, what the traffic was, where they live. You can have all of those details and try to use that to come up with when they'll arrive at the airport. But that's an impossible task. You're sort of trying to build in all of the complexity of the real world into an extremely long equation. And that equation is probably not gonna be defensible. Somebody is gonna be able to attack your equation and say you probably got something wrong. So what we wanna do is come up with a way to capture realistic variation that is not so complex. And what we do is roll dice. We basically replace variation in the real world, which might be deterministic variation. There are real causal reasons why some people arrive sooner than others. And we're just going to replace that with die rolls, because if we roll a die and say, when a cover comes up six, you're a certain uh, inter-arrival time. When it comes up two, you're another inter-arrival time, um, and so on and so forth. The variation we get out out of the die rolls is going to be very similar if we design things right. It's a variation we're gonna see in reality. So this is what we call a stochastic approach. Some people think stochastic is a synonym for random. It is not. Stochastic comes from the Greek for conjecture or guess. Stochastic modeling is taking a guess that the system that you're modeling behaves randomly, even if it doesn't. So for the purposes of simplifying the simulation or simplifying the model, we assume that the system is random, even though we have a pretty good idea that it is not. There are probably not quantum mechanical effects, you know, causing um, people to arrive with variable inter-arrival times to an airport. So there's probably not a fundamentally random reason why people arrive with variation at an airport. We don't care it's easier for us to model, assuming it's random. Then all we have to do is figure out the right randomness to best represent reality. And so, um, and it just turns out that coming up with a couple of parameters on a random distribution is a lot easier than coming up with some long deterministic formula that tries to represent what is actually going on in a deterministic world. So input modeling is the term that we use to represent this process of choosing random distributions to best match real world data, even if the real world data isn't fundamentally random. 
the variation in real world data can be modeled by random distributions. That's stochastic modeling, and that's what we do in this class. Does that make sense? Are there questions about that? About the difference between random, which is, you know, it's actually describing things that are, you know, that are random versus stochastic. Stochastic means using randomness in a model, even if the fundamental system you're modeling is not random. So stochastic operations research, similarly, you're using random models because it is easier to model the world as a random process than it is to try to model all of the nooks and crannies and deterministic details of the world. So the advantages of this approach, it's gonna simplify um, our implementation of variation because you know, if you have a normal distribution, I know mean and variance, two parameters, done, and but, I can ask a computer, give me a normally distributed random variable or random variant, and it will give me numbers that fall along that bell curve. So I just get natural variation. So long as I can manage to choose the average and variance intelligently, then I get variation that fits my system well. So the challenge is, of course, coming up with um, uh, coming up with those parameters, and then the fact that our system that we're simulating here now is going to have variable output itself. And so our challenge is gonna be able to deal with the variation coming out of our simulation model. And so that is gonna mean that, whereas maybe in a deterministic model, we run it once and it gives us one answer, in our simulation models that are stochastic, we run them 10 times and they give us 10 different answers. So now our simulation model is gonna require us to use statistical methods to make sense of those outputs. So advantage, we simplify the programming. Disadvantage, we now have to use statistical approaches to understand what comes out of our simulation models. And we probably can't just run one simulation anymore or simulate one customer. We might need to simulate 100 customers or run 100 simulations or run 100 simulations of 100 customers. And after the midterm, then that's when we start determining um, exactly how to figure out how many customers and how many runs in order to answer the particular questions that we're trying to answer. So just as a summary of that, um, we have activities which are the statistical distributions that go into our process models. Those are our inputs. We use input modeling in order to come up with those distributions. So we know the distributions of how long individual components of the model take. We combine all those things together into this process diagram, this, uh, this logic, this discrete event system logic. And then that gives us variable outputs. So we can measure things like waiting time of each customer, things like that. How long does it take for us to process 10 customers, et cetera? And those outputs generally are going to be things like delays, queue link statistics, et cetera. These are things that we only know if we run the simulation and then measure it. So we get the, but this output variation fundamentally comes from the input variation we bake into it. So we choose random distributions, we pepper them all around a system, we simulate what happens when all those random di distributions bump into each other, and we get new random distributions on the outputs of our simulation. And then we have to sample those in intelligent ways to make sense of our simulated system to then make inferences about the real world system that we used when we were originally creating these input models. So that's the basic process of what we do in stochastic simulation. And we have to be careful because when we choose those input models, we can choose bad input models. So if I am choosing a statistical distribution for how long do we wait between customers, uh, if I were to choose, let's say, one where we wait you know, 10 seconds between every customer's arrival all the time, I can run that into my simulation and I can get beautiful simulation results. And those simulation results I can show to my stakeholder and convince them that the system that I've built must be terrific. But if I then put real world data in there and it turns out that there's variable interarrival times between customers and sometimes customers pile up 
and other times customers have long times in between them, then those bursty events where customers pile up might break my designed system. And so now that I've created a, a truly a, a more realistic input model, I get a realistic picture that the system that I crafted is not any good. The system I crafted is only good if I have maybe fixed times in between customer arrivals. And that's very similar to this fashion model example here, where we might portray fashion um, on the right and say, look how great this jacket is. But what we, the people watching, our stakeholders, you know, are looking at here is they might, the thing they might be attracted to about the jacket might be something that's actually a property of the model. So the model that's back here. And so it may not be the jacket, which they end up actually buying. They end up thinking they're buying the model, but when they're shipped the jacket and they put it on themselves, they say, this jacket doesn't look any good. And that's because the model that they used was an inaccurate model for the real world. So that's what we view these distributions. These are like our fashion models and the discrete event system simulator, simu the discrete event systems, those are like our fashion. And when we combine the two of them together, those are like the variable outputs that we study in this class. So we need to come up with good models to get good outputs. Insightful outputs require good inputs. And then we need to then do replication. So those are the kind of the key points that I want you to come out of this is that we need good inputs and potentially lots of replication. So that covers all of the preview or all of the, the kind of the past stuff. And now we're gonna start looking at exactly how we schedule these simulations. So this is kind of like part two of the homework that has been assigned. So are there any questions about any of this basic fundamental terminology of the discrete event system simulations? Activities, delays, inputs, outputs, measurements, et cetera. Okay. All right. So, um, the, so the thing that we're going to be moving on with um, now is the event scheduling worldview. It's kind of the terminology we use in discrete event system simulations. So events are the times where the state of the system changes. So as we've talked about um, already, and so we only care about the system when the system state changes. And so we don't care about anything in between. And so time is going to move in irregular jumps from one event to the next. We're going to skip over think, times where the system state is not changing. And so there is going to be a calendar of events that is maintained by the system software where it constantly is scheduling the next event that is going to happen into the calendar and then moving through the calendar set of events. So in the second problem of the homework, and then what you're going to start doing in lab two is that you are going to manually maintain this so-called event calendar as if you are the simulation software. When we start getting into Arena, Arena maintains the event calendar for you. So this is what we're trying to understand is what's going on behind the scenes of these simulations. So at each event, we're going to get a simulation clock that moves to that event. There's going to be some logic based on the state of the system right now, how many uh, how many uh, um, entities are in resources? How many entities are waiting for resources, et cetera? And so based on those things, we figure out whether we need to move an entity into a resource, whether we need to um, remove an entity from the system, et cetera. And then after we do that, we need to then schedule where the next events are going to happen. So if we've just moved an entity into a resource, we need to schedule when that entity is going to leave that resource and add it to the event calendar and then recycle so that then we move to the next thing in the event calendar. And that's what we're going on uh, here. So the event calendar is um, also known as an event list or a future event list or a schedule. Both textbooks will use um, these terms differently and interchangeably. So sometimes you see them uh, in the event calendar, sometimes you see future event list. So um, you should be familiar with these different terms. Um, computer scientists refer to the data structure that stores these as a priority queue. The fundamental option or operations that we have in an event calendar is we need to get the next scheduled uh, item out of the event calendar. 
and we need to insert a new item wherever it should properly go to maintain time ordering. So when we schedule a new event, we assume that it's gonna go into the event calendar wherever it's supposed to be, such that when we ask for the next event, it gives us not necessarily the event we just scheduled, but whatever the next event in time order is. So we might schedule an event that's gonna happen after the next event. And then when we ask for the next event, we'll get the next event and eventually we'll get the event that we schedule. So we'll see an example of that here in a second. So the event calendar is something that makes the simulation go, but it is not a state variable. You do not have access to the event calendar as a program. The programmer can look at the event calendar to debug what's going on. But in the normal operation of the program, when you're actually writing your logic for the program, you do not have access to the event calendar. All you can do is basically ask, what's the next event? You can schedule an event and you can ask what the next event is. You cannot ask, what are the next three events? You cannot say, what is going to happen in the event calendar 10 events down the line? You can only get the next event out. And that's the key in these discrete event system simulations. So as an example, let's say we're simulating a car wash. Car wash has an entrance where it generates the entities. It has an exit, which disposes of the entities, has two resources. It has the car wash and it has maybe the vacuums for the car wash. There are maybe um, entities, which we can view these as have different attribute types. This one is a particular type of car with a particular color. This is another type of car with another color. And we have um, a set of events. So these are all the events that will end up getting simulated by this simulation model. We have an arrival. We have an entrance to the resource, the car wash. While car A is in the car wash, notice there's this whole string of time here between car A entering the wash and exiting the wash, you get an arrival um, of car B, which has to wait on the wash. So even though car B becomes ready for the wash here, it has to wait for a certain amount of time for A to exit the wash. And then that's the instant that B will go into the wash. So these are the things that will end up being simulated. So um, automatically, so this is what the event calendar sort of looks like after the simulation is run. During the simulation, we have to build this up as we go. So we, all we know initially is that car A arrives at a particular time. And so we jump to that time. The clock is updated at that time. And once it arrives, then we need to say, in the logic, what is going to happen next? Well, we know that if car A arrives, then we need to schedule when car B arrives, and we need to schedule when car A enters the wash. So those are the two things we're going to schedule next. And so we are going to schedule that in the future, car A is going to drive a little bit. So that's what we're simulating is how far they're driving until they actually hit the, the car wash resource. We also need to schedule when car B arrives. So now that car A has arrived, we need to get the next arrival in the books. If it's not in the event calendar, it will not happen. So whenever you schedule an arrival, before you move on to the next step in the event calendar, you have to make sure you schedule the next arrival or else your event calendar will just stall out. So we have to schedule when car B will eventually arrive. So after that, we're done with car A and we can jump to the next time, in which case we do all of the simulation logic that corresponds to entering the wash. Well, when you enter the wash, you now consume a resource or you're using up a resource. So we need to schedule when that resource will become available again. So we put into the event calendar the exit from the wash. So now we know that car A is gonna be in the wash from here all the way to here. We have added an event. Now that won't be the next event we jump to because there are events in the way but we know that that event is going to be taken care of. So in the event calendar, it takes place there. Hey, we can now jump. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, quick, I have two quick questions about this. So um, first, oh, um, is this like event schedule or something that we like plan before we do the simulation or do we like put these events in as the simulation is going? The simulation will put the events in as the simulation is going. You as a student for homework one and lab two, will manually do this initially, just so you can get a feel for what's going on. But the simulation software like Arena, for example, or FlexSim or Simio, you'll give it um, distributions for your activities. And then it will then draw durations from those distributions. And based on those durations, it will populate this event calendar 
as the simulation is running. So the event calendar really only has the first, you know, the, the left hand side of it populated at any time. And as events are processed, they generate new events that get added to the calendar. So then in retrospect, we can look back and say, what's every event that happened in this simulation? And that's kind of the original view that I showed you. But when you start the simulation, we actually don't know. It's kind of the event calendar is pregnant with potential. We have no idea what's gonna go into the event calendar. And the simulation is the thing generating the events that get populated in the event calendar. And it's kind of like a bootstrapping process because as it generates an event, then it moves to that event to generate the next event. So it's kind of like just generating the next event in order to generate the next event in order to generate the next event and so on. Okay, so the next event that gets generated, it's always the one immediately after the event that has happened, right? It's not like some no. event that's far in the future or something? Well, that, so that, that, that's the tricky thing, is that like in this example here, when car A entered the wash, it generated an event, it scheduled an event the, of the exit wash, but that exit wash happens after the next event. The next event in the list is the car B arrival. So you're, you could be scheduling things far in the future. They will eventually get processed so long as they're not after the end of the simulation. But, um, but the next event is just whatever happens next in the time ordering. And you may have scheduled an event after the next thing that you're currently scheduled to do. It is possible that you could have scheduled it. It might be that this is a quick car wash and it might've been that we scheduled the car wash here if you can see my mouse. And so um, that, um, that, that event could be the next imminent event, but, um, but it may be that the activity duration of the car wash is so long that you have to schedule the end of the car wash that is after an event that you've already scheduled. So you don't, it, you will eventually get to it, but the next event that you'll jump to might not be the event you just scheduled. Okay, that makes sense. So basically, there can be like two to three events that have already been generated that are going to occur right after you finish the one that you're on. That's right. That's right. Okay, thank you. And, and another question was sent to me, is the next event also the uh, called imminent event? And I would say that the, um, that the, the imminent event, I mean, so I guess that terminology is something that um, I don't use formally. Maybe another textbook uses that formally. Maybe your own textbook uses it and I just forgot that they use that. But I would say the imminent event is the event that you're just coming up on as you jump to a new event. It's the current event that you're processing. That's the way I would define that. I'm not gonna use that term uh, formally in the class, but that would be my guess is if you've seen that term before, that's what they're referring to. So we would jump to what I, I, I would call the imminent event, car B arrival. Even though we just scheduled car A's exit, we have to process car B's arrival because it's the next thing in the list. So then at car B's arrival, we know that whenever a car arrives, we have to schedule the time it takes for it to get to the car wash. So that's, I schedule the time it takes to get to the car wash. But I also know that in order for me to keep the simulation going, I need to schedule the next arrival. I need to schedule car C's arrival. And so I'm scheduling when car B hits the wash, hits the beginning of the wash. And I'm also scheduling when car C arrives. Now that could be very, very late. That could actually be after the end of the simulation. So I might not actually get to that event when this simulation ends. So, um, so that, but I'm putting it there that that has to be scheduled. So at every arrival, you have to schedule what happens at arrivals and the next arrival. That's kind of a thing in any queuing system, every arrival, you at a minimum schedule the next arrival and you also schedule a system specific things like the drive to the car wash. And then I can keep going in this process. I jump to the next event. So now um, I have jumped to car B is ready for wash. It's sitting there at the car wash, but the car wash is in use. So the car wash is currently being used by car A. Car A has not um, exited the wash. I know that because internally there is a state variable which represents the car wash being busy. I can ask car wash variable, are you busy? And I will have already updated that. When car A was put into the wash, I will have updated a state variable that says car wash is busy. And so when car B arrives, I, my logic asks, is the car wash busy? When it comes up, yes, the car wash is busy, 
then the simulation logic, instead of putting car B into the wash, it puts car B into another state variable, which I'll call a queue. And it's just a list of cars waiting for the car wash. The queue was empty, and then now it has car B sitting inside it. And it's just gonna sit there. I do not know at this inst at the imminent event, at the instant of this event, I do not know how long car B will sit there. I have to just let the simulation roll. Now, as an observer looking at the event calendar, I can guess that it will be available when car A exits the wash, but I only am allowed access to the event calendar for the imminent event, for this event right here. And from the perspective of this event, I have no idea how long car B is gonna wait. That's why this wait is known as a delay. I have to run the simulation to figure it out. So then I can jump to car A exiting the wash and the logic for when a car A exits the wash is to move car A to the vacuum. So that schedules car A's drive to the vacuum because it takes time to get to the vacuums. But then I also can look at the, uh, the, the state variables and I can say, oh, look, there is a car that is waiting for the wash. I can move car B into the wash. So that means I can empty the queuing state variable and I can schedule the exit of car B's wash. And so that I schedule now, I've got car B is in the wash for this whole time. So I didn't write formally that car B entered the wash here, but it's implicit that car B entered the wash here. So then I can jump to car A, uh, entering the vacuum. Um, I can schedule the end of the vacuum and so on. And so I can keep going that. So that is how a discrete event system simulation works. The beauty of this is that instead of simulating every second of time, I can I skip huge portions of time. I only jump to when interesting things happen. And that can make discrete event system simulations very fast. All right, so these durations, these activity durations, um, can be provided in a list format, like I'm gonna do for you in homework B1 and in lab two or as they'll be more realistically done um, in random distributions of given parameters. So I can say that the inter-arrival distribution is exponentially distributed with an average time of two minutes. And then every time you need a new inter-arrival time, you draw a new random variant from that distribution. For now, I'll just give you lists of variables and that's what we'll end up, you'll end up seeing for your homework, but moving forward, they can be random. Um, Things that will make more sense as we move on is that um, you have to be careful when you program these things in Arena, Simio, whatever, is that when you program a resource, it may have a certain time unit, so let's say seconds, but your simulation as a whole has a generic time unit of, say, hours. And so you have to be careful about your time units whenever you're writing your simulation logic. You have to make sure that if you're using different time units, you provide conversions or you make sure to use the same time unit throughout the whole thing or else you can get some pretty ugly um, uh, logical problems. All right, so any questions about any of that? We will do this even more in detail, um, walking through a hand simulation uh, in the next lecture. So the generic approach for those working um, in the homework um, for a simple queuing system like this one, this is a one server queue. Um, the, I don't, the link of the, the question, so we haven't given out that, I'll give an attendance question here in a bit. So there's no, um, so the eventual attendance question link there is a, someone asked for is uh, bit.ly, 475 uh, ATT, that's the attendance question link and the um, question link for asking questions is that link. Um, I'm seeing, looking for a question here, events can be placed anywhere in the, um, I wouldn't, anywhere in the priority queue determined by simulator ahead or behind existing events, depending on the precedence of the prior events. These events have a property like a timestamp. So you're basically saying we may primarily look at this like a log file to see um, why something is, yes. So there's a question of how you as a programmer can afterward look at your simulation calendar as to debug it, to look as a log file to say, does it make sense? And you might see that things are being scheduled in way in a different area than you're expecting them to be scheduled. And that might point out to you that you're using the wrong time units in one of your components. 
So that is how you as a programmer would look at the simulation calendar. From the perspective of the program, the event calendar um, is, is just used to get the next event and to schedule events into it um, and keep them ordered so that you only process the next event. So you might schedule something way in the future. So the event calendar ensures it won't come up until it absolutely needs to come up after you've processed everything that happened before it that might already be scheduled. All right, so um, we're not gonna get through, I think um, all of these simulation steps here, but that's okay, because we'll go over this at the beginning of the next lecture. But, um, uh, but just for those who are looking forward, these next couple of slides are a recipe for how to simulate an MM1 or a, a single server queue that um, like the one that you're simulated in your homework. So it says sort of what you're gonna do initially, what you do on arrival events, what you do on departure events, what you do on end events. And again, we'll go over this at the start of next lecture, but you can follow through these steps and it'll basically follow through going through the event calendar like we did in that graphical example. And then, um, so again, in the next lecture, we'll actually do a hand simulation where we will apply all these steps exactly like you do in the second question of the homework. So um, I'm gonna skip the questions thing here. I'll hold them to the end of the class. Only other thing I might mention here is that after the simulation, there are other metrics that you'll run like average waiting time, um, utilization, et cetera. These are things where when you look at the 100 customers that you simulated, you'll aggregate over those customers to come up with these averages. And those are um, different than state variables, even though they might require you to keep track of things in a state variable like format during the simulation. Like you might need to keep adding up um, you know, how long did that customer wait? Add that to an accumulator, which kept track of how long all the other customers waited and so on and so forth. So that at the end of the simulation, you can divide by the total number of customers to get the average waiting time. So there are other variables that you might maintain in your simulation, which are not state variables. They're auxiliary variables that help you calculate these performance metrics afterwards. And that again, will become more clear as we move on. All right, so I won't go through this example, but um, this is just motivating this idea that your um, simulations are gonna have variable outputs and they are going to require um, variable, um, they're going to require statistics to deal with that variance. You can't just run it once and then run another simulation and compare them. You're gonna have to run 10 of one simulation and 10 of another simulation and use a t-test to compare them as an example. All right, so let me get to the attendance and then I can take any questions and anybody can pop off if they want. So the attendance question uh, for today is, um, we'll say, is the, I said that the, um, what is the priority queue that is, what is the priority queue called? Give me a name for the priority queue that keeps track of all of the events that are scheduled as you run a discrete event system simulation. So go to that first link, this link that's shown here on the slide, bit.ly 475 ATT, and tell me, give me a name, I listed like four of them, give me one of those names for the priority queue that is used inside the discrete event system simulation to keep track of the events that are scheduled. That's what I want you to give me. And that's all I've got for you today. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to hang out for a couple of minutes before I go to my next class. Um, otherwise, if you don't have anything for me, you can feel free to drop off the call here. So are there any questions? And I can put that question into um, what is one name out of the four I gave for the priority queue that keeps track of events during the simulation. And that's, So any questions? Thanks for the great questions so far. Thanks for uh, all the great questions you've been emailing and posting otherwise. All right, it looks like um, gradually people are popping off and no questions are accumulating. I'll maybe wait another minute and then I'll end the meeting.
Hi, Professor. Yep. Um, yeah, so I'm just still kind of trying to understand like uh, how the event calendar works. So there's certain things that we tell the simulation, uh, like what events need to happen and then uh, the distribution of it. And then the simulation makes the event calendar and then kind of tells us what's going to happen. But we, we need to run the simulation to know like all the events that are going to happen, correct? That's right. That's right. And so you will um, tell the simulation that a cashier, um, that cashier's processing time is a normal distribution with this mean and this variance and um, entities arrive at a cashier before arriving at a bagger or something like that. And the bagger has got their own distribution. And then what the simulation will do is it'll say, okay, I'm going to, um, uh, the first arrival to the cashier, I am going to draw from that distribution and schedule their departure. And, um, and then when they depart, I'm going to draw from the bagger distribution and schedule their departure from the store. And so the simulation will use the distributions you've given it to maintain its own event calendar. Okay, and it takes into consideration the activities and the delays, like both of them combined, and there's just like a list of all of that together? Well, that's the, the beauty of it. So the, the, it takes the activities come ahead of time. It takes into account those. And then we figure out the delays by looking at how things ran. So the event calendar after the simulation is actually, um, you can pick out the delays out of the event calendar after the simulation. So it doesn't know about the delays, but, um, but just due to how the activities line up, like in the, that car wash example, um, car B was ready to enter the car wash, but it couldn't because car A's wash activity hadn't ended yet. And so in the event calendar, we can see that car B is ready for the wash, but doesn't enter the wash until a little, second, a little bit later. That little bit later is a delay. That delay came from stacking the activities up and just seeing how things mismatched. So delays are kind of generated by mismatches in activities. And our job as operations researchers or industrial engineers is to restructure systems to minimize that mismatch. So we minimize the amount of delay generated. Okay, uh, and like the event calendar will just be a list of things like uh, car one, five minutes, uh, car two, a little bit more than that. And it's just like a list of how long, it, like starting from time zero, each event occurred. Oh uh, yeah, the, I mean, what's on the event calendar or the future event list is, is it, it usually, it's definitely gonna be a time, it's gonna be a type of event, and it will be any auxiliary information um, needed to process that event when it comes up for processing. And so you might, um, there might be a customer associated with that event, for example. And so you need to sort of have, um, to know which customer to process or something. So, but generally event calendar, the, the most important thing is the, the event type and the time. And then the rest of it is just auxiliary info that you might need to save um, to know how to start the execution. Because logic is kicked off by every event. Very awesome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, I'm starting to see people pop on for my next class. So in that case, I am going to uh, end this one and see everybody on Thursday. See everybody in 475 on Thursday. In 325, I will see you in a couple minutes. Actually, for those of you in 325, I'm going to end the meeting just to kick everybody out and rejoin um, one uh, immediately after that. So I will, uh, so if you get kicked out, just rejoin.